everyone. This is Heba Abdelgawed, and I am an Egyptian Egyptologist, which means that I specialize in the history and archaeology of Egypt. Today, I'll share with you some of my own frustrations with how ancient Egypt is presented or perhaps mispresented in museums all over the world, and some of the new ways that I myself, together with my colleague Alice Stevenson at the University College of London's Institute of Archaeology, with a collaboration with too many partners from Egypt, uh, artists as well as community activists and cultural organizations, in addition to six institutions in the UK, working our way around how can we change the way Egypt is presented and displayed in museums in the UK and perhaps in the future all over the world. How many Egypts do you think there are? There is the Egypt that you see in museums. This is usually one of mummies, pharaohs, gold, one of achievements, one of luxury, and one of contributions to the human world. Nowhere do we hear of perhaps the failures of the ancient Egyptians. Neither do we hear of the miseries of the ancient Egyptians or perhaps the exploitation that they might have faced by the higher authority and power. It's usually a very happy space. Not only is it a happy space, but it's equally frozen in time and place. We only see Egypt as pharaonic. We only see Egypt as ancient. The other layers of Egypt are totally hidden. Not only is it frozen, but it's equally orphaned. It's a country or it's a concept rather than a country that has no connection whatsoever with, with its modern communities. The Egypt that you see there is one that is happy, one that is frozen, and one that is orphaned. This is totally different than my Egypt. My Egypt is one that is quite um, a depiction of continuity and change, where there are the pyramids, but there are equally clotheslines, where you would hang on your wash, and even that has a cultural code, where you would see the male underwear at the very front of the line, making an announcement that there is a man in the house, part of the social stigmas, I would say, but part of a cultural goat that everyone tends to follow, be it from the poorest of social stratas till the, the richest of social stratas. It's also an Egypt that has a multiplicity of history layers, a multiplicity of ethnicity, and even the Arabic that we speak has ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, Coptic, Greek, Italian, Spanish, English words, and equally Arabic. So it's just a representation of our multi-layered and multi-ethnic history. But nowhere do we see this Egypt in any of the museums that we see. This is not only problematic for museum display, but it's also problematic for us. Because of how we are made absolutely invisible, how we are made absolutely silenced from the displays, it means that we end up being disenfranchised, at times displaced, from our own local space to give space for the heritage that the West is fascinated with. The other problem that Egypt is facing today that even currently when museums all over the world are rethinking of how can they make mends of the past? How can they um, give back what they might have got from other cultures or from other communities illegally or perhaps unethically? How could this be all healed? Interestingly, even the current discussion of decolonization, the current way of trying to rethink or uh, confront a past that was full of violence, that was full of many lives and memories lost, Egypt remains a blind spot. It's totally obscured from the discussion. The discussions usually are talking about Africa, but Egypt is not perceived as part of Africa. The discussions are usually about objects. They are not about people. And they are always led by Western academic and Western institutions. It's also very museum centered. It's only happening for the benefit of museums, not for the benefit of the people, the communities. Nowhere do we see the source communities in any of the current discussions of decolonizing museums in the West. How can we then solve this? Or at least how did we think that we can have some solutions for this. 
one solution that we're putting forward in the table that maybe this can change by changing the questions that we're asking. Instead of focusing on repatriation, which is something that would take years to resolve, and it's something that even today remains dictated again by the Western academic institutions and by organizations, while the multivocality of communities are very difficult to get involved in, then perhaps we need to change the question that we're asking. How can we use the museum collections and the archives that exist today in the West in a way that can benefit the source communities' lives, in a way that it can bring meaning to them, either through social justice and social inclusion? That wouldn't solve the past, but at least we can ensure that we are on the right track, that whatever we're doing would end up being beneficial for the communities from which we have extracted the heritage in, in the first place. And who make meaning and bring meaning to this heritage up till today, every day. One of the ways to bring social justice and social inclusion to communities by using these collections and archives is making sure that they are involved in the current conversations that the museums and the Western academia is having surrounding those collections and their colonial legacies. How can we then achieve this? Luckily, Egypt's social media offers us an excellent platform to ensure that we can communicate with the Egyptians, perhaps not all of them, but a representative few of them at once, equally allowing them an opportunity to talk back to us. In this respect, we are not only talking down to them, but we're opening our platform to be used as a dialogue where we can interact live with the people of Egypt today in how they perceive the many ethical questions that are being raised on the table and the current uh, active mode of confronting colonial legacies. Egypt's social media is a perfect platform for this because it's quite representative not only of the majority of the age group of Egyptians, but equally the social strata. So it means that we can then at once be talking to Egypt multivocality and Egypt's multivocality could talk back to us. But then we need to find a very Egyptian way of using social media to engage with the Egyptians. One thing that Egypt is known about is the sense of humor. Egypt's sense of humor is renowned perhaps all over the Middle East. I wouldn't argue that it's the world, at least the Middle East. Um, and it's a sense of humor that is used not only to cope with difficulties, but it's equally a problem solving mechanism that we tend to use whenever we are faced with a difficult question or perhaps some sort of disturbing past or even present, a comic uh, strip or a meme can be our way into openly and perhaps transparently discussing it. There came Nasser Jr. Nasser Jr. is an upcoming cartoonist who tends to use social media uh, as his own platform to release his art. Not only is uh, Nasser one of the very few cartoonists that are extremely funny and have a very wide fan base, but his art can allow us to achieve the three R's that we think are key in communicating with source communities. First of all, that his discussions or the comics that he tends to release are quite relatable to the majority of the people, be it in Egypt or in the global world. They are equally relevant. He, all, he tends to raise uh, problems that all of us tend to face not just in Egypt, but also all over the world. Most importantly, it's quite responsive, as his COVID com comic here makes it very apparent. Whatever he releases is very responsive to instant events or even instant concerns and worries that the whole world tends to suffer from. So being relevant, being relatable and being responsive, we felt are the three R keys that can help us engage with the communities effectively and equally transparently. Most importantly, because of how the concept of Egypt is currently a very Western concept, because it's the byproduct of colonialism, he can help us re-Egyptianize ancient Egypt again. And he's already doing this with very, um, very famous and world famous characters like Superman, Batman and even Simba. He manages to Egyptianize every Western concept and the ancient Egypt that you see in the museums today is a Western concept. And we felt that through working with Nasser, we would be able to Egyptianize ancient Egypt and how it's presented not only in the museums, but equally uh, throughout all the various media. 
Most importantly, but perhaps for the case of Egypt, is that um, Nasser himself and his fan base are quite representative of the majority of Egypt's population. That is the youth, the 61% uh, that make up the whole of Egypt, which is a very important target audience that we were very keen to engage with and involve in the conversation. But apart from that, social media is known also for how it can be a difficult platform, although quite open and quite accessible, but equally difficult in dealing with difficult issues or in dealing with um, concerns that may, might raise uh, traumatic experiences. And talking about colonialism can be traumatizing for source communities today, and it can be distressing for the successors of uh, the previously colonial powers. We were very keen on not only making our discussions transparent, but equally sensitive, because we are concerned with how that what counts here is us being inclusive and us reaching our goal than us being radical in the conversation that we're having. In the occasion here, sensitivity comes first before being radical. I'll share with you one of the things that we've used, and it's uh, the perhaps the most successful um, model that we've managed to introduce, given the feedback that we've received from everyone uh, online, but I'm obviously equally biased, but it's the comic series that we released. We called it, as you can see from the photograph here, Nasser, Heba, and our dispersed heritage. What happens here is we are represented, representing the multivocality of Egypt's community, be it the community of practice, that is myself, Heba, the archaeologist, the community, uh, the community of place, as in uh, Nasser, as well as he is the community of interest, being a comic artist, but we are equally presenting ancient Egypt with us. We've personified ancient Egypt here as a character with us, a main actor, because we would like to perceive ancient Egypt here as displaced individuals like the many displaced individuals today all over the world after perhaps particularly from the Middle East after the 2011 uh, political uprisings. The ancient Egypt that we find in museums out of Egypt are for us then displaced objects, not objects, but displaced human beings. The conversation that we're having or the backstage conversation that I would be having with Nasser when discussing with him the, ver the variety of heritage issues that are currently uh, pressing in the world of museums and in how Egypt is displayed throughout the world was the main theme that we're using for our comic series. Also, we were very keen to regain the agency back to the people by sharing that this is not Egypt's dispersed heritage, but it's their disp dispersed heritage, as in our dispersed heritage. Our here refers to the majority of the Egyptians. So we're operating in three community groups here, me, Nasser, and ancient Egypt. We're operating with ancient Egypt as displaced individuals, and we are bringing back the agency of the dispersed heritage back to the source communities, back to the people. We've got six partners in the UK. We're working with five UK museums, the World Museum in Liverpool, the Petrie Museum of Egyptian and Sudanese Archaeology, the National Museums of Scotland in Edinburgh, Manchester Museum, and the Horniman Museum and Gardens in London. Equally with the Egypt Exploration Society, the, um, the society that was in charge of all the British-led excavations that took place in Egypt during the colonial times between 1880 and uh, 1980. We've put it up till 1980 because this is the time when exporting artifacts from Egypt has legally ended by a law from the Egyptian government. We've used the case of Britain and the case of the extent and the scale and the scope of how Britain or the British-led excavations and the British-led uh, work and collecting in Egypt in terms of archaeology have led to the dispersal of Egypt or Egyptian artifacts throughout the whole world. This is an endeavor that is the largest in the world, and this is based on the findings of our previous project that was led by Alice Stevenson and Professor John Baines, the Artifacts of Excavation, and that was based at the Pichi Museum of Egyptian and Sudanese Archaeology. Such wide dispersal or such case of wide dispersal of Egypt, how can we 
display to the Egyptians? How can we bring this conversation with the Egyptians and let them know the scale and scope of this person? So we presented the actual event as it happened. When I was telling Nasser, uh, when we were discussing the project, the extent and the scale and the scope of how much uh, Britain was involved in extracting artifacts from Egypt and exporting them to 350 institutions in 27 countries in the five continents, the immediate response from Nasser was to wrap himself like a mummy. Why was, why was Nasser wrapping himself here like a mummy? Because he felt that that could be his only way to travel the world. People like myself, like Nasser, Perhaps the majority of the Egyptian community, as well as the majority of the Middle Eastern community, do struggle to get visas to enter the very same countries that hold our heritage. While our heritage is able to travel the world, we are usually denied access. We are usually denied entry. What we've done then is that we brought the information, the extent and scope of colonial extraction and exportation of fines, and made it very relatable and relevant to a concern that most of the Egyptian community and the wider Middle Eastern community struggle with today. That is being able to travel outside of our source communities and enter the many countries that equally host our heritage. The responses that we got online were equally uh, on the spot and perhaps it made it very um, apparent that the point that we're raising and that it's not only Nasser who feels that only if he's a mummy, only if he's an ancient Egyptian object, he is allowed to travel the world. The question that came here was a question of heritage over lives. Since the 2011 uprisings, we've seen uh, a rise in the funds offered by Western countries to be able to protect our heritage. Yet, refugees from the Middle East were denied entry. Refugees were not very welcomed in most of the very same countries that were offering money to protect our heritage. Whenever there is the question of our heritage or our lives, our heritage wins. It is priceless while our lives is cheap. That was also an argument that the Egyptians and perhaps the wider Middle Eastern community can make up of these persisting colonial practices and colonial legacies. This was our way to show that the imbalances as well as the racism, as well as the exploitation is still ongoing. The other most uh, perhaps fashionable debate that we're having today, and I'm, I'm stressing on the fact that it's fashionable because it's only discussed today, although it has been happening from the 1880s, is the human remains, the Egyptian human remains and the extent to which they should be displayed in museums and the ethical uh, complications that comes with not only displaying the museums, but equally researching the museums. The problem that we have with current discussions uh, regarding ancient Egyptian human remains, again, the discussions are Western-led. They are led by the Western institutions. And because of the fact that there is this uh, persisting racist perception that the ancient Egyptian human remains are unclaimed and uncontested for, due to the, again, racist colonial perspective that the modern Egyptians are not the successors of uh, the ancient Egyptians and the ancient Egyptians are not uh, our ancestors. Due to this fact, we are not perceived as an important variable in the discussions and in the equation that is happening today of the ethical implications of displaying and researching human remains. The solution that we had is bringing um, an archival document from the Horniman Museum and Garden that was discussing the unwrapping of one of the mummies, together with a coffin that is currently also in display in the Horniman Museum and Garden. This is the same method that we use with all our comics. We usually make it evidence-based. Every comic that we re release discussing any type of topic is based on objects and archival material that exist in our six UK museums and institution partners. And we try to make the discussion quite local and quite Egyptian by bringing a very famous uh, scene from a very famous Egyptian comedy movie called uh, The Great Fava Beans of China. 
And there is a scene from it where, uh, which became widely spread as an Egyptian meme of being ignored in discussions. That's what we did. We used exactly the same scene into making a comic where you would see Nasser and myself in the middle between two white uh, male scientists. And that was on purpose, using them as two white and two male uh, scientists. And they are both, the two male scientists are discussing the ethics of displaying and the ethics of researching uh, the ancient Egyptian human remains, while me and Nasser standing in the middle and we are struggling to be heard. This is um, quite relevant and quite relatable to and quite responsive to the sensational uh, news stories that have been uh, dominating the media between 2019 and uh, 2020 that about certain research that one would perceive as a bit unethical uh, coming out and discussions have risen regarding the ethics of such research and regarding the wider ethics of displaying uh, Egyptian human remains. While the Egyptians were totally sidelined, totally ignored from such discussions. We tried to make this very clear and we tried to make this very apparent through our comic here. The responses that we received from the people were very interesting and if they show something, uh, they show how diverse and how varied uh, the communities perceive whether we should display or not display human remains. Again, something that strikes us that there is usually the perception of the Western perspective and the local perspective. And usually communities are seen as one uh, homogenous group, which is a quite racist view as well, because the community in itself is not only multivocal, but it's equally diverse in how it perceives itself and the world. The conclusion that we had, that we had from, uh, or the conclusions that we have, from um, the community responses that we received made us think that in the end, communities are interested in being part in this discussion. They are there and they are making their opinions out in the open. It's us who's not listening to them. What does the comics and perhaps what did we try to make very obvious to the people today? not only to the museums, but also the wider communities that we were engaging with in social media. Usually, uh, the justification that we tend to have about leaving such artifacts in the Western countries where they are today is that because these are universal museums. Universal museums tend to display universal human history. But in reality, as our comic here shows, given the fact that we are usually denied visas to get to these very same Western museums, to what extent are these universal museums accessible to the universal world? They are not. The conclusion that we want to bring is that universal philosophies usually are Western philosophies and are equally biased, and that some of the colonial perspectives and power imbalances are still persisting up till today, even in the discussions that we're having. Apart from that, there is a very, very persisting colonial perspective in the sense of what counts as a continuity, what counts as a community, what counts as change. What is heritage? Equally, that comes from what the West perceives as heritage, whose heritage it is, again, the West who gets to decide who owns this heritage, be it universal or be it belonging to the source communities. Again, the local perceptions and the local values and most importantly, the local emotional um, attachment to the heritage is absolutely sidelined or is absolutely isolated from these conversations. What we can think about is that um, there is this perception that confronting the colonial legacies and their practices is something of the past. These are practices and legacies that do not exist today or that do not have an impact on communities today. But this is not true. From what we're seeing that many of the colonial practices that led to these objects leaving the countries of origin are still persisting in the way that the source communities are absolutely again once more sidelined from the current decolonization turn. The perception that museums in the West have about why they are doing all of this in terms of decolonization comes from a very um, self-centered perception. They are doing it to confront the past. But in reality, confronting any of the persisting colonial practices and their legacies, it is and it has always been a matter of social justice. 
And there are usually two W's that one should ask him or herself before attempting any act of decolonizing, being inside the museum or outside it. Who are you doing it for and for who? And if the local communities or the less privileged or the less um, represented, those who have been silenced and absent throughout are not at the core of why you are doing it and for who, then what you're doing is simply recolonizing. This is quite important, achieving social justice. This is something that we don't only owe the social communities. It's something that we owe ourselves and the future generations. And thank you so much for having me. This research has been funded by the UK's Art and Humanities Research Council, and we're very grateful for our Egyptian communities without whom we wouldn't have managed to achieve any of this. Thank you so much. Peace and light to you and yours. So I, I you know, I sometimes do this and do that.